as useful from the standpoint as a, of a business. Matt, I'd love to uh, I'd love to disconnect, but there's always that fear of just losing touch with all these people that you you know grown fond of over the years. But uh, there's just so much crap on there too, right? Avoid it. Yeah, Jeff. People still use that. I agree with Jeff. I, Kurt, I, I was I had to do my little back and forth thing there, so I had to mute myself. But I think what you were referring to is FOMO, which <laughs> we talk about all too often these days, just a bit more formal. Hey, Marty's here. I think we're gonna let Marty join us. Yeah, we should. And I think Harmony's gonna join us as soon as she possibly can. She may or may not have video, but uh, we should still be able to hear her and have her partake. Um, hey, Marty, you're a co-host now. So if you do wanna speak, you're able to unmute. Um, ah, here we go. We've still got a couple people trickling in. We actually filled up a like this, we doubled this tasting and then some, I think we squeezed every last drop out of the bottles. So we got a really full turnout tonight, which is awesome. And by the looks of things, you know, we, we have once again got uh, everywhere. We've got people joining us from the Pacific, I'm presuming all the way to the East Coast. So that's kind of cool. And by the Pacific, I mean like way out in the Pacific um, where Phil and Suzanne are making us all feel jealous because they're in Hawaii. Uh, but while we're waiting for the last handful of stragglers to join us, um, I guess first I should say welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us on this uh, fine Thursday evening. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you by now have seen or heard, but uh, as we've been saying, we got Dodge Rammed, which is to say a Dodge Ram was used to destroy the entrance to our shop. Um, so we might have a door some point tomorrow. They're they're building our temporary entrance. And so we may be able to let customers into the shop for the first time in eight days on Saturday. So uh, fingers crossed on that. It has been a long eight days, but we do want to say thanks again to everybody uh, for your, your thoughts and your emails and texts and DMs and everything. Um, the odd card that's been dropped off of the shop too. Very, very kind and much appreciated. Um, before we get there, I wanted to just quickly highlight, and while we're waiting for the last handful of people to show up, I wanted to highlight a handful of tastings that are coming up that we still have some spots for. Um, so if you'll indulge me for a moment, Kurt has put the lineup in the, the chat if you want to get your whiskeys in order. Um, the next tasting we've got space in is Anoka Distillery with Dave Scott, who used to be the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society guy for Northern Alberta. So that's coming up. There's tickets available. Certainly encourage you to join um, the KWM cast. Well, that's sold out. Um, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society March Out Turn. I know we say this every month, but there's a couple of really cool bottlings this coming month. Um, 15 spots left for that. So check that out. Um, many of the other things are sold out. Not all women in whiskey. Ladies, gentlemen, please sign up for this tasting. Um, it will be led by women for everybody. Um, but the point of the tasting just being that women play an important role in the whiskey industry. And uh, two of the ladies from our shop, Harmony and Chelsea, will be quarterbacking this one. And 100% of the proceeds from this are going to go to a women's shelter, the Brenda Strafford Center here in Calgary. So check that out. Um, later in March, we've got a bourbon tasting. Evan's contractually obligated bourbon tasting. I can say for a fact, there is nothing in Evan's contract that requires him to do bourbon tastings. For some reason, he just thinks it tastes good. Uh, Kurt and I don't always fully understand this, but uh, he's into it. So some of you guys seem to be into it. So that's good. There, there's uh, handful good of ones. They're just a little bit oh, more for sure. clean. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Kurt, you got Shamrock and Shenanigans coming up um, for St. Patrick's Day. Um, there's the Wildlife Distillery Tasting. And I know we said this about 10 days ago that we were gonna dump a whole bunch more tastings on the website, because we have some things planned. We've got um, a Cavalan tasting planned. We have a new kids on the block tasting planned for some of the new distilleries. Um, <laughs> but then we got Dodge Rammed and that kind of um, forced us to slow a few things down for a little bit. So um, we will get um, that up shortly. And to Kevin's question here, can you sample the SMWS if you're not a member? 100%. Um, anybody's welcome to join the SMWS tastings. Uh, they're $45, seven cast strength whiskeys. So there's no requirement to become a member. 
Um, but if you want to join either after, during, or, you know, never, if that's all good, um, that's entirely up to you. So uh, I think that's all I was going to say for an intro. Kurt, anything? No, man, I've been waiting for this one. This is an exciting one for me. Rocking the Burgundy t-shirt tonight. Um, there is literally no distillery in the world who I have more affection for. Um, and a better history with than Brooklady. Well, there's, there's does just, Ard does Ardbeg know this, Kurt? Have you told them? Yeah. So my love there is is deep and passionate. But Brooklady is more of like a, if I had to choose between my kid and my wife or my girlfriend kind of thing. You know what decision do you make? It's got to be in this case Brooklady. So call it Sophie's Choice or whatever it is. Um, my my stories there, the way I've been treated there over the years is is gold. Mm -hmm. So. With a new range like this, I haven't tried any of the last about six in this lineup. So this is super exciting. Wicked tasting. Yeah, uh, I'm excited about this too, partly because last year when the Octomores got jacked in price by like, what was it, like 70%, like they almost doubled. I think your reaction and my reaction was like, whoa, these aren't going to sell. But, but they keep selling. And I think I was actually concerned this time around because it sounded like there was not a lot coming. And in the case of the 12.3, there wasn't. Um, but I think like yourself, I was very keen to try them. And then the one that I think we can have a bit more forgiveness for, like the jump in price, and we'll talk to that when we get there, is the Black Art. Because now we're talking about almost 30-year-old whiskey. And I mean, I think when the Black Art series started, they were what, 25? I think the, the first Black Art was 24 or 25 years of age, somewhere in that range. Yeah, somewhere in there. They've had a few, like, I, they may have started even as early as 23 or 24, to be honest, mm -hmm. but they've so, been kind of all over the map for that. Yeah, but uh, anyway, it's uh, it's going to be a cool range. And Marty, I think like like Kurt and I, you've been to Brooklady. Yeah. Yeah. Long. Yes. Yeah, and what are you most looking forward to in this lineup tonight? Uh, well, I have to say the dark arts, and then the and then the uh, Octomores. So, yeah, what the, you're not excited about classic Laddie? I guess there's a baseline. Not that excited, no. <laughs> Danny just sorry, Andrew, go ahead. No, no, you you go. I just saw a comment there. Danny just filled us in a little bit. Black Art One was 19 years old. There you go. Crazy. So, you know, yes, the price is now uh, effectively four times or th at least three and a half times what the original Black Art was, but it's also a much older whiskey now. So um, that's something to keep in mind as we go through. And Marty, to your point, we'll see how we'll see how the classic Laddie shows. Yeah. Um, I, th I think in some of these verticals, Curtin, you know, we've done a lot of these since COVID and Unlike before, I mean, the only time we would ever do a, a Brick Laddie range tasting is if someone from Brick Laddie was coming through. Yeah. Um, but when we've been doing some of these ones, I think we're often surprised by, you know, maybe they don't wow, but how well made most most of the distilleries we like talking about entry level whiskeys are. So yeah. I guess we'll see. We'll see what we think about the classic Laddie tonight. Um, so again, Everyone, thank you very much for joining us. Um, the lineup tonight, we are going to start with the Classic Laddie. Kurt, do you want to fire that into the chat one more time just for people who, who just got here um, or who only recently joined us? Sorry, um, that's I'm actually, too badly. That's fine. It, it's, it's Zoom. I think we'll get over it. And I'm going <laughs> to fire that into the uh, chat on Facebook for the handful of people who are watching on Facebook in case they're also taking part in the tasting, either in person or vicariously. I've fired that into the chat. Um, so we're going to start with the classic Laddie, then on to the organic, the black art, the Port Charlotte, um, PAC01, Pac-Man edition, I'm guessing. Um, Kurt knows the actual story. I'm sure I wrote it on the website at 1.2. And then we're going to do the Octomores 12, 1, 2, and 3 in order, because why not? We could have sliced them up in any different way, but I think it kind of makes sense from the, the story of the distillery and the way they approach their whiskeys to go with them, to do them in order. So that's the way we're going to do them tonight. So without further ado, ladies and gents, um, your uh, classic laddie, maybe a quick toast um, to a, 
a better week ahead for Kensington Wine Market this week with an actual door, so slanch. Mm. Creamy, malty, a little bit cheesy. A bit sweet on the Sorry, go ahead, Marty. Uh, some sweetness on the nose, a bit honeyed. Mm -hmm. So this, like, do you, do you recall this curtain? I honestly, I don't think our website for this product's been updated enough because it's one of those ones that we always bring in, but I don't think it ever gets a lot of love. I know you like selling it to people, but uh, are we talking here just straight bourbon cask for this one? No. Um, the cool thing with these ones is disclosure of multiple ages is a problem in Scotch whiskey, um, hence the existence of non-age stated whiskey. Um, you probably all are aware you have to, your age statement has to be the youngest whiskey in the bottle. So to kind of get around this and to give people a little bit of transparency, where Gladi has actually put a little code on your bottle for the classic Gladi and all those kind of bottlings, you can go to the website, select the range it's from, put in your code, and it's going to tell you the entire cask makeup that went into that. Um, even these, the classic Gladi's and such uh, are generally a mix of wine casks, sherry casks, um, refill, um, and in some cases, even some virgin oak. So they literally vary by every single bottle, which I think is super cool. And I think um, this sort of style is, as Andrew said, it's one I sell a lot because I'm really into this kind of style. To me, it's a dinosaur type of whiskey, much like Spring Bank is. So it's a little bit more robust, a little bit heavier, a little more grain driven. And while Spring Bank has a certain funk, we're glad he has, as Andrew said, a sort of cheesiness, a sort of lactic kind of note that carries through most of the listings. So this is a, a killer entry level expression. As part of that. And uh, I was going to add to that, Kurt, that I think one of the things that I think is kind of cool and refreshing about this is look how pale this is. Like, mm -hmm. the, the, I know, granted, it comes in an opaque bottle, that aquamarine bottle. But so I don't know on one level, maybe they're hiding from the color, but in practice, they're not. They're embracing that. And I think it would be very easy to use a lot more active casks for a young bottling like this to add that greater depth of color, to add some like texture and, and you know flavor and aroma, but really kind of allowing this to be a bit of a spirit driven young whiskey. And that coastal element is everything here. It's meant to be rough and rugged. It's meant to be kind of saline. It's meant to, Brooklady literally, when you talk to people at the distillery, they want the whiskey to kind of taste like you just had a splash of ocean water in your dram at the side of the distillery. Um, and you kind of get that. It's rough, it's ragged, it's kind of dirty, it's a little bit salty. And I, I love it. I think it really takes me to the Marty, what are your thoughts on this young laddie? Oh, I think it's it's uh, nice, refreshing. It's I don't think I've had it in a little while, so it's a just a reminder of what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's... It's nice to have a, a good starting point like this. And when we don't have, it's not a big lineup, not like the old days when you used to have, you know, 50 different to choose from. But uh, those were the, those were the troublesome days, Marty. You might remember <laughs> where we tried to find room on the shelf for yeah. all the releases because they were scrambling to keep the business afloat. So yeah. they would just release another collectible edition. And one year, I think they had 32. And I remember being like, come on guys, like, this is too much. We can't keep up with this. We don't have room for all of these. Um, yeah, comments on this. I mean, to me, it kind of, you know what it kind of reminds me of? It reminds me of a coastal, cheesy Glen Morangy 10. Like if you were to kick the alcohol up a little bit, like it's got a nice minerality to it. Um, like I find Glen Morangy 10, one of the things, you know, it's not insanely complex, but it's well made. It's very clean. But this has got a kind of, it sort of reminds me of that. Like this is its cousin from the, from the backwoods, the coast. Um, and yeah, it's very pleasant drinking. And I think it's a nice, you know, intro into the DNA of Brooklady as it's been made since it, the distillery was, was brought back to life in 2000. Yeah, I would agree with Rene that his comment, it's not the 50%, I'm not sure why, if they choose 50% for a reason instead of like 46 for non-chill filter, but I think it, it's working quite nicely with this whiskey. There's there's brands, you know, I question them with Mortlock and stuff like that when I've had ambassadors through for the club or whatever. Um, it said, you know, why this strength? 
And I've been told on multiple occasions, some strengths are just chosen to have a signature. So mm-hmm. Brooke Laddie's base signature, you know, just like Talisker's the 45.8 or whatever. Um, this is just literally a, a Laddie calling card at this point that they work with. Um, it's kind of cool, kind of identifiable. And, you know, that extra couple of points is just a little bit more texture and a little bit more flavor. I think it's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, it allows them to say, well, 46% is good. 50% is better. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of like 46 is the new bare minimum. Um, we're going to take it one step further. And I think part of this too, I mean, they're able to get away with this probably more than a lot of other distilleries because they've been filling their casks at a much higher proof for a long time too. Like they're not filling them at 63 and a half. They're predominantly filling them, I think around 68 or 68 and a half. So, um, Anyway, it does well. Has anyone dared adding a drop of water to theirs? Would you dare? <laughs> drop of water? Yeah, I don't take water in this whiskey personally, but this is one that does swim well. I've had it with water. It's just young and feisty. It's, it's not old enough that it's going to break in any way, shape, or form, and it's not a sherry style or anything. So water's a good thing this one. You know, I mean, so for me, this is a great whiskey for me to taste again. Um, certainly... I tend to focus and obsess about things um, higher up the food chain as far as older, rare whiskeys. But just as a reminder that this is great. And, you know, Kurt, I have to say for for the shop, you're you're always very good at that, especially with certain whiskeys like this, like Ardbeg 10, because, I mean, these are really the, you know, the meat and potatoes that pay the bills for Brooklady and that also can justify us getting single casts that can help us to get you know, better allocations of octomores. And, you know, we have to remember that, you know, there's part of that game that has to be played, but it helps when it's a good product and it's something that you can be genuine and sincere about too. You know, when we get geeky in these conversations, there's so many faces that you can see here that nod along to certain points that you can tell, yeah, you know, we're all on the same page here with levels of knowledge and stuff like that. You get to that point because you know whiskey in youth and in mid-range and really, really old. You see it in different styles and stuff, and you start to understand what makes a good example at all ages. And I think having a bit of perspective that most of those old whiskeys that are recognized as brilliant classics now that people want to try that have those really uh, profiles like old peated space ciders and stuff like that are coveted. They were served up really, really young and kind of rough most of the time. There wasn't too many older expressions. There's a lot of bottle aging that has accounted for some of the really high scores. And in other cases, there was just a few random casks that were left to sleep long, typically through Indian bottlers aside from the or something like that. Yeah. But most whiskey was generally served up kind of, kind of feisty like this. And I like it. It's just a throwback style. Well, it's true. Like um... I have a friend, well, we know a mutual friend that we deal with out in Ontario, Igor, who's on many occasions sent me miniatures of things like White Horse blended whiskey, um, which was predominantly old Lagavulin, but young, really young and quite rough. And you're right, like after 30, 40 years in these tiny bottles, like the bottle aging polishes Mm -hmm. them incredibly. So yeah, they're very complex, but I think your point is well made is are they that much more complex or would they have been that much more complex when they were bottled than the stuff, the young stuff that's out today. Yeah. And in a lot of the case of a lot of distilleries, I don't think they would be any more complex. So um, quick comment on Jeff's comment. That's a little bit further up the line there. You can actually find Brook Laddie on the shelf spring bank. You cannot um, also putting things in perspective. I mean, I think we think of Brook Laddie as this young feisty distillery because of the, the whole Jim McEwen, Mark Rainier, Simon uh, Coughlin, was that his? It's Coughlin, right? Yeah, Simon Coughlin. Like the guys in, you know, Duncan McGilvery, all these like great guys who got the distillery up and running and going. Um, But, you know, once it was going, it was doing more than five times the production Springbank was right off the bat. And so the reason that Remy Cointreau, which owns Bricladi now, has stock to work with. And to be honest, that I'm surprised they don't offer more stable entry-level expressions because they've got stock like they keep building new warehouses because they have a lot of production maturing i'd like to see what those numbers actually are because a few years back they launched a port charlotte 10 and they launched a brooklady 10 the the laddie 10 they call it right and then there was a 16 and a 22 but i think we're always meant to be more limited 
But that Laddie 10, they did a couple additions and then they had to pull the plug because they didn't have enough mature stock. They didn't have enough 10 year olds to continue the line. And that's why we went back to the classic Laddie. And to, the, to their credit, there's often casks that are older than 10 in this. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I honestly don't know if they have a lot of mature stock. Good question. Well, it sounds like a trip is in order. We'll have to go and investigate for ourselves. I agree. Empirical um, evidence or no evidence. Exactly. <laughs> well, let's move on to the organic. Um, this is the organic 2009, which uh, Kurt, we were talking, we thought we still had some, but I, I was just snooping on the site to see if I could pull some information on this. And I believe it is actually now sold out, um, which is too bad because um, you know, we were talking about even the Laddie Classic is not currently available. Um, so we're going to have to wait for that to come back in. Uh, this was um, distilled in 2009 from orga- organically grown barley, harvested in 2008. The whiskey's eight years old, matured in bourbon and Tennessee whiskey, aka Jack Daniels casks, before bottling at 50%. And I think this one's kind of a... Um, an interesting one because this is going to be a very clean style spirit because you've not got as we were talking before the wine cask um available and phil's saying it's available on the site so maybe the search oh yeah it does look like there are a couple of bottles of this kicking around um thanks for pointing that out phil um but i, was but like, I don't think we're saying it was available thanks for saying i don't think we can yeah i don't think we can get any more thanks for proving kurt right i think is what he's trying to say um <laughs> Yeah, I guess it goes to show like you do more of the stocking than I do. So you would be more likely to notice that. But regardless, um, straight bourbon cask or American oak, because I mean, Tennessee whiskey, Jack Daniels, let's just call it bourbon. It's the differences are very minute um, in terms of how it's going to season the wood. Um, So what are our thoughts on the organic? And especially we've got a great comparison here, too, because the Laddie Classic 50 percent as well. And probably if you're averaging things out, also going to be around seven, eight years of age. More honeyed. I think there's a there's actually a bit more oak presence in this. Some like vanilla notes, honey notes, toffee coming out of it. It's like you um, you took the first one, added just a touch of like a faint pink bubble gum, crushed up some cinnamon toast crunch cereal on it. And then aged did an extra two years or so. A little bit more vanilla tones, like you said, a little bit softer and creamier. The um, crunchy bar. What's the the filling in the crunchy bar? You know the um, sponge toffee. toffee. Sponge toffee, yeah. So that's it's <laughs> it's it's like the the crunchy bar, but without the chocolate on. I do find it a lot hotter on the palate than the than the cla- than the uh, classic, the laddie. I agree. I think the nose is softer, but the palate, I, I think it kind of lacks that maybe sherry and wine cask cushion that the first one has a little bit. Yeah, the, the barley and actually the sharpness to me really is coming come from like this grassy, malty barley. Um, and it almost fades into like a faint metallic note too. It's interesting you say yeah. that because I was just getting a little bit of um, like pencil shavings on the nose, a little bit of that minerality or graphite sort of note and a little bit graphite. of graphiteness. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not yeah. overpowering. It's not in a bad way, but um, you know, it does beg the question with some of these like releases, like, is it, you know, that organic nature of it, a bit of a gimmick, um, you know? And the, the reality is with most organic single malts, they always have to be ex bourbon. Um, because it's just, I think it's a lot harder to get, do organic sherry casks in particular to keep the, the sherry cask from spoiling when you're shipping it from, uh, Hareth to, to Scotland. Yeah. This one's a little bit hot, a little bit naked on the palate for me. Um, <laughs> the first time I, I met Mark Rainier, uh, at the Brooklady distillery, it was 2010. And I'd been picked up by Alan at the airport and driven to the distillery and toured around and saw Mary and saw Jim and everybody. And then he took me to Mark's office. And I don't know if you remember Mark's old office, Andrew, the great big sprawling thing. I went in and Mark was like hopping around the room like an angry little hobbit, like pacing the place, like his hair was on fire and his dogs leaping all over the place kind of deal. And 
he gets introduced to me and he's, hi, Kurt, nice to meet you. His gravelly voice and everything. And here, here, here. And he hands me this glass and shoves it up under my nose. And uh, he's like, tell me what you think. So I'm kind of giving him some notes. We haven't even said hi properly at this point. Um, so I'm giving him some notes and stuff and he takes it and puts it down. And he starts talking about how he doesn't know how the whiskey world is going to take to this. And this is something huge and everything. Um, he then proceeded to say bloggers were going to be the death of all this kind of stuff. I was a blogger at the time. Um, he said he hated the people who were so opinionated and wouldn't just listen to reason and whiskey and all this kind of stuff. And then he, to, to, you mean to Mark to listen to Mark. Yes, basically to listen to Mark. Um, he pulled on a pair of welly boots, grabbed his dog and his leash and said, I'll be back in a little while and then just disappeared. <laughs> and I just waited in his office for a few minutes until somebody came to get me. But the, why I say this is what he had me helping him write tasting notes for, and he was typing and stuff as we were doing it, was the organic expression. I think it came out in the green tin. I don't think it was the first one. I think it might yeah. have been the second one. But uh, I literally helped him write tasting notes for that organic expression, um, kind of on the fly in his office as he was drafting up the first drafts of the tasting notes. So I've always had a little bit of a soft spot for the organic. organic. Um, mm. Though it's never been even close to my favorite, it's just the stories. Well, and, and Mark's a character. I mean, uh, I, I I've got time for him, but there's times where you can have too much Mark. And my first experience with Mark Rainier was quite different from yours. He was hopping around like a hobbit who was, had not taken his ADD medication, and um, we were sitting on his couch, and he proceeded to lecture us for three hours about like terroir. And the only thing that broke the monotony of the conversation, because like I was interested, but not three hours interested. And that's the abridged version. <laughs> yeah, was his dog biting my hand, like almost drawing blood. So, you know, he's, the funny thing is he's still passionate. He's still fired up now, but he's, I mean, he's clearly got enough on his plate that he can't justify three hours ranting at one or two people. So, um, but yeah, that was, I always kind of hoped after that, every time I went there, I was like, please let it be Duncan who shows me around. Please let it be Duncan who shows me around. Partly because he was such a nice guy, but also partly because he wouldn't lecture me about anything. So um, yeah, good times at the Brook Lottie Distillery. Uh, should we move on to the black art? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's go to some Old Town whiskey. So I can actually share my screen for this. I don't know if we'll be getting more of it. I don't know how much we have left, but it's less than a dozen bottles. Um, but we've still got some of the Black Art 9.1 in, going for 7.69 a bottle, which I'd have to look back and see what we sold. In fact, I could probably check this while we're on here. But I think, well, I won't do it while we're looking at this. The I think the original one sold for around 220, just going from vague memories here. Um, but as always, they don't declare the full creation when Jim McEwen came up with this, they, you know, they while they were going with this, he was like an alchemist trying to create something from, you know, top secret ingredients, AKA wine casks. Um, and, you know, Kurt, we've talked about this before, you know, I love Jim. Like, I think he was an incredible salesman, you know, and he certainly did a lot along with Mark Grenier to build Brooklady into what it is. But I know we talked about this. I think the, it was the Blackheart 5.1 which was, I think is still one of my favorite releases of the entire series. And that was the first one that was not made by Jim McEwen. It was made by Adam Hannett. Yeah, Jim, um, I honestly can't think of a bigger, better person in the whiskey world. Um, he is the legend. He is, will be our John Madden, I think. Honestly, he's a rock star and he likes to tell rock star stories. Um, I miss the guy. He's a good friend, and it's been a long time since I've seen him. But you're you're 100 accurate. He is the best guy in the whiskey world, best speaker, best ambassador, best source of stories and knowledge and lore and stuff. But I don't think he has a great palate. To be honest, he's got a proclivity for wine casks and heavy, heavy styles that aren't necessarily to my liking or a lot of people's liking. But having said that. There's an awful lot of people that absolutely adore that style, and we can't keep those special releases on the shelves. There, anything is gobbled up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. What? Well, again, there's 
you know, it'll, it'll remain nameless, but I know you and I have laughed about this many times that certain retailer who had trusted Jim to pick a sherry cask for them. And it was just like undrinkable. Um, but anyway, what one, are you going to do? One of two whiskeys on Iber <laughs> Uh All right. We're nosing the Blackheart 9.1. Doesn't right off the bat come across as too much wine cask. Like you can, I can, I would say it, it comes across more as like French oak. Like you've got those nice, like warm gingerbread tones, um, spices and like candied fruits coming through, but it's not, um, yeah, it's not coming across as wine casky as I thought it might. It, it has a sort of soupy style to me where it's like, um, you know, when you make a soup and you just throw in a bit of everything to get your base going. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, but my buddy does. That's how he literally makes the soups. Um, it's kind of got that, like, a bit of sherry, a bit of wine cask, a bit of maybe virgin oak, even. Like, it's loud. It's kind of just a little bit of everything. But the, the cool thing to me is it actually sort of works. Because wine casks to me, just like you, I'm typically saying, yeah, I'll pass, unless somebody's saying you have to try it for a certain reason. Um, this isn't overly whiny. It's got some nice cherry tones on it. Um, you know those boozy kind of brandy cherries they have next door, those creatines? A um, mm -hmm. little bit of that on there. Some other kind of almost tropical OMG sort of fruits and stuff too. Almost mm -hmm. sangria-ish. Um, kind of neat. We'll see what the palate is because the palate is where the wine always hits me hard on these ones. Yeah. Well, before I get there, I mean, I am starting to get like wine gums coming off on the nose. But I'm also getting like ginger and molasses cookies with like a soft white cheddar on top. I can see all of that. Good news. There's a little bit of those. Did anybody here ever have those um, when you were a kid? Because I haven't seen them in years. They probably can't make them now. They were like black licorice pipes. And on the end of the pipes, they had little red dots, candies. When you had that bite, it had a little bit of candy with the licorice. There's a little bit of that coming through on the nose too. For me. You could also call that candied fennel, where you're getting that sort of licorice tone, mm -hmm. but then also like that candied uh, candy coating. Shlomo's saying ooh, and I'm not sure if that's because of the his tasting of the whiskey or if it's the idea of the ginger snap or ginger molasses cookie with uh, soft white cheddar on top which has to be tried it it works shockingly well together um, incidentally ginger cookies also go really well with foie gras so highly recommend that too um i like the palate i mean i find i think this is quite drinkable like i can see where some people here are saying it's too woody or the you know, maybe there's like a bit of a bitter astringency starting to creep in, but I like the palate. I think it's it's very drinkable. There's a little bit of a flinty kind of palate, almost sort of gunpowdery note on the palate, but it's not sulfuric, if that makes any sense. It's not like anything's been struck and burnt and stinky or anything like that, mm -hmm. but it's just a little bit flinty and metallic. It's kind of strange, but it's, well, it's not also like musty. It's not really whiny. You know, you get sour funkiness. You always get that weird tang on the backs of the tongue with those wine casks. It's always at the back end and the finish that it falls apart. And I actually, I like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, it, I, I'm glad I have the wine, whininess, but it's not, it's not a sour tone for me. It's more a bit of the red wine fruit, not gone bad, but it's, uh, it's for me, it's almost the wine influence is almost at the point where it's past my, it's not quite past my what I like, but it, I wouldn't want more wine influence on this. I think wine is being handled a lot differently nowadays in the whiskey world too. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot more barrel rinsing going on. I think there's a lot more retoasting going on too. In which case, even if it's not the full SDR process, any sort of toasting or anything like that is just gonna re-caramelize those wine sugars. And I think I have this theory, I've said it here before with different groups, when those casks are emptied, the alcohol that was in those barrels was not high enough to inhibit any kind of bacterial action and continued fermentation and stuff like that. I think in transit, those barrels develop a little bit of funk and that carries through to the whiskey, unless they're emptied and filled right away. I think these are some nice clean barrels. I don't get any of that or else they maybe treated them, rinsed them or something because there's no funk to it. It's, it's kind of cool that way. 
Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Kurt, I think your point's right. I mean, you, you've been enough, been around enough distilleries to know that, uh, casks tend to sit around for an inordinate amount of time before they get filled. Um, and Scotland, because it's generally so damp, um, people can do, tend to do that outside. So they can just leave the barrels outside to keep them wet. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I mean, this isn't my favorite release of Black Art. Like I, I still think uh, the five one is my favorite. And I think, the, I don't know if it was the, se I think the seven one I really enjoyed too. But it's good. It's a good whiskey. Um, and it's a nice older example of Brickladdy. We're seeing less and less of that because there just isn't stock to be had. Uh, not a lot of production between 1983 and 2000. In fact, I think most of that was around 89, 90 and 93, 96. There might have been like a little bit mid 80s, 84. But I just know there's not a lot of years of Brick. Like they don't have every year. There's a lot of gaps in production. And what remained from when they bought the distillery from uh what was it white or it was no it was white and Mackay in 2000 Hi. there's just not very much of it left and uh this is a cool example of pre-closure Brickladi and, and nice to have um harmony if you are interested in chiming in either audibly or in audio and visual you you are, have the ability to unmute whenever you want if you feel like it which it Thank looks like you. you did. Oh, you're <laughs> welcome. So we don't get to see you. We just get to hear the dulcet tones of your voice tonight. Yes, unfortunately. Uh, we're down to one laptop at the moment. So I'm using my phone uh -oh. and my phone is still uh, damaged. So we'll just leave it off. Um, Weird not having a face when the voice is talking. It's kind of like uh, she's our how. She's the, the, the brain behind the machine. Well, I have a face for radio, so I'm sure I'm knocking it out of the park right now. <laughs> well, Harmony, just if you don't agree with uh, either Kurt, Marty, or I at some point tonight, you can just say, I'm afraid I can't do that, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm afraid Perfect. I can't agree with that, Andrew. <laughs> but anyway, hey, we did give a big plug for your um, women in whiskey tasting. So maybe oh, before we move great. on to the Port Charlotte, do you want to just quickly tell people why they need to take part in your women and whiskey tasting? Um, yes, they should take part in the women and whiskey for many reasons. A, it's ready. As of tonight, I finished pouring um, the whiskey. Right. So that's exciting. There are also eight whiskeys in the lineup. So I think that's exciting. Uh, $40 is great value. Um, you had and something? you hustled. You hustled this one. You got all the yeah. agents to pay for bottles. Yeah, every agency came together and paid for bottles so that we could donate the money to uh, the women's shelter in yeah, Calgary so, here. So we're yeah. super excited about that. Um, Good job, Harmony. Yeah, I, I could hustle all of our events, I think. I mean, I could, I'm pretty pushy, <laughs> but in a good way. It's for you guys. Um, it is. And, uh, and then on top of the uh, the just the good lineup of whiskey. We get to try every style of whiskey in the lineup, which I think is exciting. Bourbons, rye, Irish blends, um, scotch. And uh, we get to hear uh, hopefully either in-person or pre-recorded messages from uh, just women working across the globe in the industry in all different aspects. So I'm excited to hear their message and just hang out and drink. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Harmony. I'm sorry, I had to mute myself for a second there because the Facebook feed froze up. Well, um, glad to have you join us. We're now going to move on to the Port Charlotte, the PAC01, which, Kurt, you're going to tell us why this is not the Pac-Man edition. Um, <laughs> in, uh, in a way, I kind of wish it was. Like, that would be kind of fun. Someone needs to do a Pac-Man edition whiskey. Yeah, I'm nervous about this. So I'm going to kind of go back to the last one. The last one, not really my style. The Black Art has always been my least favorite in the Brooklady range, even though they are older laddies. And even though that pre-closure stuff should be exciting. Um, my second least favorite in the laddie range is the special edition releases of Port Charlotte they've done since the end of the PC series. The um, CC, MRC, MC. Um, they've been heavy-handed on the wine. Uh, but I think... 
again, like Andrew said, Adam has a slightly more restrained palette. Um, I'm kind of excited to come at this because I know there was some of the PC series, I remember PC6 in particular was Madeira cast and it was an absolute rock star. So one of my favorite whiskeys of all time, actually. This one is a Port Charlotte, which is 40 ppm Brooklady, so fairly heavily peated up there, just slightly below Groig level. Um, and it's finished in ex Bordeaux wine casks. Um, so big, bold. There's something about this style, and I don't know what they're doing for the distillation. And Andrew, you can probably maybe step in here a little bit. I'll check a note or two in my own file. But, um, Port Charlotte seems more robust and dirtier kind of than Octomore that has the much, much higher peating level. Port Charlotte always has that just heft, caramelly, monolithic sort of weight and stuff. Octomore is always a lot thinner. And I think for that reason, Port Charlotte always just seems a little bit more rambunctious. To me. But, you know, Kurt, I've, I, you know, I've asked questions about this too. And I actually think a lot of this may come down to well, for one, there's probably tweaks in the distillation. Like there's probably a much um, shorter distillation, I would guess, in the Port Charlotte than there is in the Octomore. But I think also because I, I seem to remember in my head that one of the things that Jim did with the Octomore was distill it more slowly. Um, I don't know if that's jiving with your memory. But with Port so. Charlotte, the, yeah, the other thing is... Uh, I think a big part of, and this is the thing that I've always found a little bit um, funny about Octomore and Supernova, is there seems to be something different about the way the peat comes across when you get it up to the high 80s or over 100, as opposed to just 40 to 50, that it becomes less dirty. And it seems like it's more smoky, like it's more about the smoke and less about the actual peat and the dirt. And maybe that has something to do with what happens to the phenols at like to get it like when you're malting it commercially to get the phenols to that level maybe there's something they're doing that's different as opposed to when you're doing it to get just a 40 or a 55 ppm malt just to take that a step further because we are geeky enough to all be in a brooklady tasting drinking lunch in Octomore tonight the comparison is probably even more apt than you think because you're comparing supernova and Octomore. While they're both the most heavily peated, that's the obvious comparison. Ardbeg has a purifier on the still as well. So they get an extra clean, extra sweet spirit as it's condensed, as the spirit, the heavier spirit is coming across. Um, anything that gets too heavy falls back down through the, through the purifier and gets redistilled, creating a lighter spirit. Same effect to a degree can be done by, just as Andrew said, slowing down your distillation giving it more time to be in contact with the copper. That's essentially what Ardbeg's doing too. So if Brick Laddie is in fact doing that, as Andrew says, yeah, you're going to come up with a sweeter spirit that's going to strip out some more of those nasty phenolic kind of notes that are there and give you just a cleaner, smoky style. I think, honestly, I think the theory is 100% sound. Re replying to a comment Jeff made privately to Jeff, if you send me an email, I'll discuss that issue with you. Um, on an, yeah, on that note, Kurt, it's the same thing with Ardbeg because I find like with a lot of those supernovas, it's the smoke is different than it is with the, the standard range. It's it's cleaner. Clean, yeah. um, so I think both in terms of the malting, but also how they distill it is trying to find ways to emphasize the smoke. And I think probably with distilling it more slowly, you're going to preserve more of that um, than if you're kind of rushing through the process. But uh, what do we think on this? Is it whiny? Not on the nose so far. I like that nose. And there's some of that nice, dirty farmyard bump going on there, too. There's a lot of spice there, though. Holy crap. Kind of makes you pull back a little bit. Reminds me of, like, uh, being on Isla and having, you know, you can't eat a full Scottish breakfast every morning for, like, two weeks. And if back in my day when I was doing my tours, I'd have to start pulling back and have, like, the oatmeal or the porridge for breakfast some days and they'd ask if you wanted a dram so like putting peated whiskey and a little bit of brown sugar or demerara sugar i guess over there on the the porridge that's what it kind of reminds me of on the nose holy shit that's good <laughs> okay this is the first one in the series that i've loved this is back to what 
the um, PC series used to be. It's clean, it's flawless casks. There's no sour funkiness there to it. There's no sulfur notes, no any off notes at all. That's just clean. It's awesome cheesy casks. though. But that's the Bruglati it's Hallmark. It's cheesy, but it's not sour milk. I agree. There's none of yeah. that. That's a, I love this style. Um, what was the last one we had? The MRC? Because that one was just extremely unpleasant. I um, could not recommend that whiskey to anybody I knew. People came in for it and they were excited about it. I was happy to sell it to them and say great things about Bruglati. But I, I never led anybody to that whiskey because I just don't want that on my conscience. It was not good. <laughs> this is awesome. What are, your, what are your thoughts? Sorry, I'm, I, I'm liking this one. The smoke's nice and clean. I get just a, a hint of wine tones on, on it, but it's just, just a hint. So it's mm -hmm. really just adding in extra notes. Yeah, for me, barley, granola, oatmeal, brown sugar. There's a nice touch of like maple syrup sweetness in there as well too. And yeah, the, the peat, it's this nice kind of ashy, kind of clean ashy peat. Um, some nice salty tones in there too. It's quite nice. Um, Harmony, agree, disagree? Uh, no, I agree. It's uh, definitely got those great oat notes. Uh, that I like and some sweetness. The oak spice is bang on. The timing is perfect for it. I love it. I, I love Port Charlotte. I'm always most excited about it. I'm sorry, my cat is, is talking. <laughs> Man, we can't, we don't even get to see it. It's so disappointing. He's mad because I just sprayed air freshener, which I got mad at him for having to do. Um, oh, he likes Bad to. Cat. Yeah, he likes to fart when he doesn't get attention. <laughs> and I got mad at him for having to spray the air while I'm trying to nose. And he had something to say about that. <laughs> oh, wow. You're, you're basically reinforcing all the reasons why I don't have a cat. Um, yeah, this is, it's not ideal. <laughs> oh, well. Um, the yeah, whiskey is I, good. Like, the whiskey is good. And hopefully it's making up for the Febreze. That's good, man. I'm so excited for that. Poor Charlotte is my favorite thing Brooklady produces. Um, and that's right in my wheelhouse. Back to clean. Little bits of cola notes on stuff there. Really cool. You know, I hope I never know, like Sky Andrews has put into the chat, um, my new laddie tasting note, farting cat. <laughs> I really hope I never experience or know what a farting cat smells like because I'm pretty sure I don't want to know. But uh, we'll leave it at that. I mean, I suppose it can't be any worse than a farting dog, but that's not pleasant either. So um, before we move on, there was, some, oh, Kurt, I'm just thinking like, you know, we always make fun of you because you pulled a guitar and never play it. But I kind of feel like for tonight's tasting, you kind of need a double guitar, like anything less than a double guitar for tonight's tasting just isn't <laughs> enough. I didn't have anything like that, but I did absolutely break up the Laddie theme colors. Oh, look at that. Surf Green and Telly tonight. It kind of matches the Laddie tins, yeah. Next next time you'll have to like do your nails to match it too, just to, to take it to that level. That's probably not going to happen. I can paint your daughters them. Can I can help. paint them, Andrew. It's totally doable. I have colors and time. Yeah. Love it. Well, we got, we, we're just, we're fermenting ideas here, which is always a good thing. Um, hey, one thing that I kept wanting to bring up, um, and maybe because we're kind of at the midpoint before, you know, and we were joking about this, Kurt, by the, you, like you said, by the time we get to the Octomore, people's palates will be nuked, but I kind of feel like they're not yet. Like, um, if, and if they're not, they will be shortly because we're about to do a trio of Octomores. But if you didn't read the note, hopefully you read the note, <laughs> um the logistics right now are so infuriating um so there's a mix of bottles in tonight's tasting because it was a matter of what we could get at the time um and we know that some of the caps are not ideal um and for some tastings that are coming up unfortunately we can't get these caps even though chelsea stumbled on the mother load of boston round bottles um but we're working on it like 
literally hounding people all over North America to track things down in the quantities we need, which are, are vast. But uh, we appreciate your patience on that. We wouldn't use these things if we didn't have to. And for some tastings coming up, but not all, you might notice that you're able to sprinkle tiny amounts of your whiskey out from the top. Don't suggest you do that. Just take that thing off and pour your drams. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a nightmare out there trying to find stuff, including steel doors, it turns out, because only today are we getting our temporary steel door at the shop. So anyway, we're getting there. Um, sorry, the comments are just flying fast and furious. Yeah, we tried Uline for bottles. Andrew, you really need to fix that picture behind you that's hung crooked before there's a <laughs> mutiny on your hands in the tasting here. Like, who's, who's uh, um, is getting triggered there? Uh, I think everybody. There is quite a few. Um, I don't, <laughs> you're not straight yet, man. It's just not going to work. Um, there was an awful lot of syllable, syllables for this caster. <laughs> no, it's not my best. <laughs> it's a pretty awesome one. I don't know if I'm going to get this one. I might just have to take it <laughs> off. It's part of the problem. Like this, this concept was not designed for gentlemen of my size that are leaning on pillows. But anyway, uh, I'm glad that everyone else's ADD was triggered here tonight too. So feels like we're leveling up. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> Octomore, Octomore. That that's what we were going to talk about, right? Okay. Yeah, so so to be fair, I should have been more clear earlier. We were trying to figure out the order for the Octomores. Andrew and I were talking about these three because they are going to be different styles. So this is going to be fun to balance between these ones. But uh, he goes, should we do them in, you know, like one, two, three, or should we do them based on this? And I was like, you know what, after your first Oct, I didn't say after your first, I said with this, we're going to be palettes fried kind of thing. It was my misspeak. But after your first Octomore, you're going to be able to go between all three and notice nuances and differences and all that kind of stuff of course for different casks but because the abv is so blinding because the peat level is so tongue scorching you're going to be fine no matter what order you take them in so i didn't mean to imply that you'd all be you know absolutely palatless at this time but i probably would <laughs> um but but regardless jeff is suggesting that brookladdy's already ordered them for us um which in a Dewey decimal system may be, may be correct, but actually, I mean, we've seen this over the years with some of the Octomore releases where they, they don't kind of naturally fit into an order. And, and in some years they've jumped all over the place um, in terms of ABV, in terms of phenolic levels. But anyway, uh, we're starting with the traditional one, the 12.1. The so let me bring my screen up here for everyone. Uh, like all Brooklady whiskeys sourced from Scottish barley, uh, malted to 130.8 parts per million, very specific, distilled in 2015, full term maturation and first fill American oak casks for five years before bottling at 59.9%. Um, I suppose that's a positive in all of this because had it been just a few degree, no, not just a few, it had it been 0.1 degree higher in alcohol strength, I guess it would have raised the prices in Alberta just for taxation. Um, Cause 60 is a, a bump. I think they add another couple of bucks to the liquor tax at that point. Um, what are the thoughts on the nose of the 12 one? Beauty, really, really clean. There's some, you know, like almost like lemon meringue pie kind of notes on there. There's a lot of lime. There's a lot of, obviously a lot of smoke, a lot of vanilla. Cola cubes. But again, um, but again, it's so clean. Like, so clean. You know, you go back to the Port Charlotte and the Port Charlotte smells dirty. Um, and it's not even as, well, it's a third as peaty, at least on, a, on paper. I'm getting a bit of chlorine on this one. I always get that um, ammonia, iodine kind of chlorine in typically in. Lafroy, Lagavulin, and Ardbeg, Carilla, and Octomore. Um, only Octomore, though. Port Charlotte doesn't seem to have that same note. Mm. Bit of a little hot, a hot tubby. Bit of a mezcal kind of smokiness to me. Yeah, yeah I can see that. It's like it's a little bit plasticky. 
it's such a clean toasted woody note it's not into burnt wood or anything like that it's like but you could smell oak kind of getting warm or toasty mm -hmm. well not in there for a while though granted it was first fill casks it has a little bit of a decadence to it too like there's some like vanilla icing sugar tones coming through Wow, that's a mouthful. Go back to the Port Charlotte and a little bit of a bacony tone on the Port Charlotte there, but mm. much more ashy on this. So much black licorice, licorice all sorts, you know, those ones with the, the stuff on them. Um, lots of citrus there again. Some burnt seafood yeah. notes. Tiger tail ice cream. Yeah. Um, but in addition to that, yeah, like I'm getting icing sugar, like coconut, coconut icing sugar. Um, and the smoke is just like, it's this clean, like, but it's mouth filling. It's this clean mouth filling smoke. It's so oily too. So textures. Um, if you've ever roasted almonds in the oven for any kind of baking or anything like that, it's like that with a little bit of cinnamon on it. Actually, a fair bit of cinnamon on it. Back to my ADD for a second. What's Dave sitting in front of? Is that Glendronic? It looks like Glendronic Warehouses. Kind of looks Glendronic-y. He's saying, no, it's not Glendronic. It doesn't look very Brooklatic. Is it, or is it Port Charlotte? Or the warehouses at Port Charlotte? Uh -oh. oh, there we go. That makes sense. And actually, I can see Alan in there. So these are the things you're like, do we say this? Do we keep this on the down low? Um, that's one of the best kept secrets on Isla. That's one of the best kept secrets in Scotch whiskey, to be honest. We all romanticize the uh, number one vaults at Fillmore, possibly the number one vaults at uh, the number one warehouses, sorry, at Rothbrook. Um, but the Port Charlotte warehouses that nobody ever sees, they're not in the Brooklady grounds. You actually have to vehicle it down the road and go into Port Charlotte proper. The edge of town, all fenced in and everything, locked up. You go into this dingy old warehouse, you can kind of see the outside texture uh, behind Dave, and those old, old doors, cobwebs everywhere, rusty barbed wire on the windows and stuff. And you get into this dank little dunnage warehouse. Ceilings are super low, like literally smack your head on the beams. We've done it every time we've been there. Uh, at least one of the people in the groups I've been over with. Um, steep, steep, rickety stairs to get down to the lower levels and stuff. In these warehouses are some of the most insanely cool whiskeys that I've ever tasted in my life. This warehouse is freaking ancient. It's just they're dumping whiskey in there and leaving it to sleep. There's casks that you can't even conceive of in there. Not saying old, rare stuff, just in terms of quality. It's obviously a really cool microclimate, really cool microcosm for maturation. Um, and somebody mentioned earlier, we don't have a Lockendall in this lineup. We're glad he actually has produced a fourth line called Lockendall that's never had an official release. Lockendall is peated to about 50 parts per million. Port Charlotte's at 40, Lockendall at 50, and then Octomore, whatever the hell it comes out at. Uh, but there's brilliant barrels of Lockendall in there, older Port Charlottes, the oldest Optimars I've ever tasted and stuff. Brilliant drowns in there. If you can ever wiggle away, if Brooklady ever gets doing proper tours, and if this is ever an option, pay what you have to pay to get into those warehouses. I'm, telling you. I'm sure anybody that's been there with me can attest to that. Mm -hmm. Harmony. I don't think we gave you a chance to, to say your words about the Oxmoor 12 one, if you're interested. Or you, maybe you're tied up dealing with a cat. I totally get it. Um, we can't see you, so we don't know, but we just wanted to make sure you knew there was room for expressing yourself if you felt the need. Um, should we move on to 12.2? I think we think we, Carmony, I just have this vision of Harmony and her cat rolling around on the floor fighting each other right now <laughs> we can't see so we'll never know i guess is the is the reality back to cheesy funk on the Octomore 12.2 yeah this is wine cast right andrew mm. 
Um, that's a good question and a good point. Why don't I share my screen? Oh my God, I Kevin just won the night. Cool. What's that? Kevin just won the night. It's over, drop the mic. We can probably shut off your cameras now. <laughs> it says Schrodinger's cat fight. <laughs> uh, Amazing. Well, I think we have to assume the cat's winning because we can't see <laughs> Harmony, so. Um, but was there? But anyway. <laughs> back to the uh, Octomo 12.2 uh, distilled uh, 2014 sorry barley grown in 2014 Scottish barley um, concerto to be very specific peated to 129.7 uh, distilled 2015 matured three and a half years and 50% uh, first and 50% second fill American oak casks before before finishing in Sauterne Barriques for 18 months. So we're back to five years of age. 57.3% is the strength of this one. Um, so those are the deets. Uh, sounds like they are having a bit of a fight. So we'll let them sort that out. In the meantime, yeah, that wine cast comes through and I mean, again, just color. There's a there's a ton more color, and we're we're looking at five years and five years. And keep in mind, this last one was all first fill American oak. It's thicker, it's creamier, kind of going into that clotted cream kind of note. Maybe that's that sort of cheesiness that I'm finding. Sorry, Andrew, did you ask me something? I uh, oh, I have been fighting with my cat actually. Yeah, we. It's we not were, fun because for me. we can't see you. We were filling in the visual gaps with our imaginations and letting our imaginations run wild, and it was really quite 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 a good time. Oh well, I'm glad you're enjoying it because I really want his dad to come home and beat him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also did not want the cat. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I hear you. So uh, he's asserting, he's trying to assert his dominance, it sounds like. Well, honestly, he wants to play. He got a toy from Santa that he absolutely loves. And his favorite place to play is on my bed because he can jump really high and it doesn't hurt when it lands. And uh, I just, I'm not doing that right, right now. Like, go away but he uh he's very vocal and uh likes to scratch things that i like and i just had a bunch of clothes hemmed and so he dug them out of the bag and scratched them because he's a dick pardon my language <laughs> wow i don't know if i'm just feeling symp sympathetic for you vicariously but i'm almost getting like kitty litter from the whiskey now on the nose <laughs> Joke's on you. His litter is wheat. <laughs> oh. 100% organic. <laughs> um, Kurt, what are your thoughts on the nose on this one? <laughs> Kurt, Kurt's preoccupied. Marty, we're going to go to you. Oh. I certainly, the nose isn't as clean as the, the point one. Yeah, I think oh. I like. I like the cleanliness, just the tones of the point one noses. But uh, and there's more barley not, when I go back to the point yeah. one as well. Well, let's see if the Sauterne cask adds something to the palate. Because I mean it it thickens up the nose a little bit, but it's not adding a it's adding a little bit of a decadence, but let's see how it does on the palate. It's definitely wine cask. There's some tannins in there. It's honeyed. Actually not, not bad for a Sautern um, finish. It is getting a little barnyardy for me towards the finish, um, but like lots of barley. I was not getting the barley on the nose the way I was with the 12-1, um, but I, I don't dislike that. It's, it's added some fruit and kind of syrupy tones to it. Kurt, do you have thoughts on the 12-2? A lot of these faces are very familiar here. You know the way I react when I don't like a whiskey. I just stay quiet. Is that so why you turn to cover up shit? No, 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 no. Um, I can say a lot without saying anything, if you know what I mean. 
Um, so mm. I'm never going to bullshit on these things. I'll never tell you I like something when I don't. I adore this whiskey too. Uh, it's wine cask. I don't know what they're doing, but it, in this range of whiskeys, it kind of seems like they finally tamed wine casks. And it's literally been waiting since about 2000. What was the first Brook Laddies we saw with them release? You know, 2001, I think they started releasing things again. Um, they've never been able to do wine casks to my liking, ever, ever. I love this style. This is cool to me. It doesn't have that weird funk on the finish that leaves me like wanting to lick an ashtray even to clean my palate. It's clean, it's elegant, it's smoky as hell. But like Andrew said, it's that, um, it's not that dirty, peaty kind of smoke. It's more like burnt woods kind of smoke almost, which is mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of refreshing. Mm -hmm. That sharp citric style, beautiful. I adore this. Yeah, the finish like, isn't exactly wine casky. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like you get it on the nose a bit, you get it on the forward palate but it finishes like a nice clean, you know, your, your farm forward, barley forward, nice, nice wood smoke finish. And yeah, I agree. I know Kurt doesn't like wine casks and he loves to say that, <laughs> but I, I love this. And of course you can't hate it because it's great. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do love being proven wine, proven wrong with wine casks. It's uh, oh yeah. It's exciting, well, it's like, right? It's it's part uh, of the journey. Like when you have that bad expectation or, or a good expectation, any expectation that you could be proven wrong on, it's a good experience. I think but generally, if I have high expectations, I don't like those being shattered. Um, <laughs> but when I have very low expectations and they're either greatly exceeded or shattered, that's kind of fun. And I mean, it's like the Mortlock cask we have at the shop that, you know, I remember the rep brought it in and he's like, like I said, why are you bringing us wine cask samples? We hate wine cask whiskeys. And um, most of the time the samples he did, he did bring in like that didn't meet with our expectations, but the most recent one did. So um, when they're good, they're good. It's obviously it's the wood and it's how the wood is treated. And I think it comes back to your point, Kurt, like they're not just dumping like in the old days of Brook Lottie, And I think this is maybe where a lot of the cynicism comes from is we all remember like pink Murray McDavid and Brook Lottie ballings because yeah. they left wine in the barrels or the casks before they put the, the spirit in and they're not doing that anymore. And um, presumably, because um, I don't think thought as embarrassing as FWP people more. Yeah, it should be right. Those, those pink whiskeys mm -hmm. were embarrassing. Yeah. yeah. I think maybe so turn casts are a little safer for wine casts. I mean, it's such, so much residual mm -hmm. sugar, it doesn't ferment easily. So it's not gonna- No spoil. tan, not the same tannins either. Yeah, not gonna spoil as easily in the cask. So mm -hmm. you don't have the same risk as, you know, like a, a burgundy cask or something like that. I have to say, I, you know, much like Sauternes perfect pairing is foie gras. And I know that's the second time I've mentioned that in tonight's tasting. <laughs> I'd like to try this with foie gras. A little bit of smoky Octomore with that sweetness coming through from the Sauternes and foie gras, I think would be great. Yeah, I bet um, that would be great. Anyway, um, yeah, it's it's bang on. So cool. One one to go, one Octomore to challenge our palates with. So uh, I'll pop up the screen here. We're on to the 12.3. And sadly, we don't know if we're going to get any more of this. We are out of it now. Um, and this is the one that a lot of people are jonesing for because it's the one made with Isla Barley. And I mean, this is a great talking point, Kurt, because, uh, and Marty, I know you've been there too. And I know many people on tonight's call have been to Isla. Isla is not a great place to grow barley, like from a purely technical standpoint. I'm not saying that the whiskeys that have been made from Isla Barley, like, the Kilholman 100% Isla, which is one of my favorite styles, hands down. Um, but it, you know, just from a pure growing, like it's wet, it's, you know, it can get sunny, but not very often. And when it is sunny, it seems to go through these periods of like rain and then long droughts. It's just not an ideal place to grow barley. But there's something about the Isla Barley releases, not just from Octomore, but from some other ranges within the Brooklady portfolio. And I don't know if the similarity here is when you're talking about 
you know, the best wines, the best vineyards having to struggle down the roots have to go 50, 60 feet underground to find moisture that they really, and if it's maybe that's what's going on with some of these Isle of Barley whiskeys that are good is that it's not great terroir for barley and the barley really struggles to grow and thrive. And maybe that's having an impact on the spirit. Um, and what do we got here? It's Isla Barley uh, oak treatments. So what do we got here? Peated to 118.1, um, matured in two parcels, 75% in first fill X bourbon. The remainder was in first fill PX sherry butts from Fernanco de Castilla, bottled at 62.1%. Not quite sure what to make of the nose yet. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm evolving on these. I was really digging that second one, and kind of thought this one fell a little bit short. But the more I'm in this, the more it just has a bit more complexity to it. I think a little bit more integration. It's kind of fun to unravel. It it reminds me of being in a cedar sauna, like not just the cedar planks but like the heat of the cedar sauna and how it like kind of sort of burns your nostrils. And I yeah, just finding it's like really, it's the woodiest to me of the three Octomores. It is, there's a little bit of like a cedar plank cooked fish, not quite salmon-y, but some kind of fish done that style. Somebody said um, peppery citrus. Um, I can see like a lemon pepper on that kind of seafood kind of note too. And something kind of charred. Yeah, there's a heat, there's a spicy heat on the nose as well. It's weird though, with that high alcohol and that spicy heat and everything you talk about, it, it doesn't have that kind of boozy swagger to it. You know what I mean? And the palate is just like a mouthful of barley, barley sugars. Um, I know the smoke is there, but for some reason it's, it seems the least smoky. There's a little bit on the palate that reminds me of Lafroig, actually. Mm, yeah. Burnt lime, black licorice, a little bit rubbery. You know, it's funny, I've gone back to the 12 1 and the 12 2, and like. Prior to the, tasting the 12.3, I didn't get like that muddiness from the peat, but now on the 12.2, I'm getting the muddiness of the peat. Oh man, 12.1 is really sweet, creamy, vanilla-ish. Mm -hmm. Oh, now I'm getting like leather barnyardy tones from the 12.3, like being in a stable after the horses have been out in the rain. 12-2 and I went deeper into those black licorice tones and stuff for me. Context is everything with these, right? When you're just variations on a theme of like incredibly high peat whiskey from the same distillery. Um, having to be ability to bounce back and forth is key. And for me, the, for me, the peat's coming through stronger on 12.3 than the other two, but... Mm -hmm. It's start, I think it's growing too for me. Yeah. Harmony, I want to hear what you think on these ones. It, unless you're fighting with your cat. <laughs> um, or if you are, maybe we'd like to hear that too. That could be fun. Um, I, I, I like it the least of the three Octomores. I, normally I try to hold these comments back for later, but I, I, re I really liked the 12.1 and 12.2 and I'm struggling with this one. I'm finding it's, uh, there's just so much wood on my palate and it's the oils from the wood. I'm sorry about the pictures behind me being crooked. I'm, I'm not fixing them again. You're just gonna have to deal with it. That sounded like a legitimately sorry, sorry. Well done. It's kind of like I'm medium sorry, so. <laughs> You said like it's so serious medium. there. I actually looked up for a second. Like, what is he? 
Well, well, I mean, we can we can continue to joke about them all you want. I don't care about that. I'm, I just don't feel like moving them again because they're going to move. So it seemed like a great idea at the time, but I guess they were imagining small children sitting back here, not grown adults. So. Um, these Octomars, I think I would want to drink them at different times. To be honest, like the first one's a little bit cleaner. The second one is probably the one I'd want to pour for people that might need a little bit extra, not just the big smoke in order to get them interested in it. And the last one is kind of like a little bit more rowdy, you know, at the end of the night when everybody's voices are going up and you have to turn the volume up on the stereo. That's kind of that whiskey to me where so, you, know, you have to be so, five or six, you want that. So for me, I would pour the first one when I'm cold. I would pour the second one when my palate's shot, but I want to continue having a good time. <laughs> and I would pour the third one when I'm sad and I don't want to be made unsad. So. Oh man, you just touched my heart with that one. I'm sad now. Do you want to, <laughs> Andrew, do you want to hug when we get in tomorrow? Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Anyway, I yeah I don't, I don't know like it I can drink it but I'm not really loving it. Harmony, I know you checked out for a bit, but uh... no, yeah, sorry, I'm here. I, I I don't want to talk about my cat, but I'm dealing with my freaking cat. Um, Do you have one of those like travel boxes you can put it in? I, I suppose that would mean you'd have to catch no. it. First. Yeah, oh, I can catch him because he plays this game where he doesn't want me to catch him until I go in the bedroom. That's where he wants me to be. Is in the bedroom <laughs> and to play on the bed with his toys because he's got like seven toys on my bed right now anyway 12.1 was my favorite I thought it was lovely uh really nice even going back to it it's it's nice going back to the point two it's way more barnyardy <laughs> reminds me of a rainy day kind of whiskey like yeah like it's fine and the third one is okay it's it's not for me it's it's like what i would expect a whiskey with that much phenol content and peat to have like flavors like taste like it's it's big it's smoky it's oaky it's peaty but it doesn't do a lot for me but it, it's what you would expect um the first one and two are great uh, i both very different but the third one i didn't love it's just overdone for me hmm. Well, you and I are in sync on that because I think I felt it was a little too much too. So, yeah. Um, Mar and and don't worry, we're going to give everybody their own chance to vote here for your for your one and two favorites. I'm just reordering the poll here. Um, Marty, do you have thoughts? What are your favorites from the October? Well, a bit torn. I I think for me, it's going to depend, you know, what I feel like drinking. But right now. I like the 12.3 the best. Just, I like the 12.1 is the cleanest. And uh, I mean, generally probably prefer that one most of the time, but you know, for some reason I'm liking the 12.3 more tonight. You're dead to me, Marty. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, Kurt, thoughts? Sophie's choice, Kurt. You got to pick one. <laughs> The older I get, the more I do this, the more I lean towards the softer, safer style. But I think I'm with Marty because you kind of look for a little bit more character. I don't normally go for the loudest whiskey in the room anymore at this point in my life. But this one kind of just has something a little bit more oomphy, a little bit more unique. And I kind of just want to drink a bit more of this one. If I had to, like, end of the night, my glasses are empty and somebody offers me one more pour, I'm having another one of this one. Is it because it's the end of the night and your palate is shot? No, I, I think it's just, honestly, <laughs> I think it's the most unique of them. Um, no, that's totally fair. It's because Kurt's got the, the song we Closing Time playing in his head. <laughs> now I do. Son of a and bitch. Maybe he will play it. I don't know it. He'll um, never play it. It's... No. Nah. Yeah, never play it. Um, should we go back through the... Back through, even though I've polished off two of my three Octomores so far, um, I'll let you guys guess which ones. It shouldn't be hard. Um, let's go back through the lineup one last time before we fire up the poll. Um, so let's go back to the uh, Brickladi Classic just to see how it's showing after a 
tasting that's uh, throttled the palate a little bit, at least on the back end. So come back to this. This screams what I was trying to say earlier. That's beautiful. That's elegant. It's flawless. Mm -hmm. Like, why would any yeah. distillery not want a whiskey like that as their entry level expression? That's so cool. A bit of time in the glass has turned this into an absolute stunner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the barley tones, the fruit, the cheese. Mm. Yeah, it's a great whiskey. Um, it, it actually really is a great whiskey. And I think you look at it, like put it in context with the Octomos. I know we've been ooing and aahing for the last 20, 30 minutes over these peat bombs. But I mean, this is barely older than those. And I think for elegance and complexity, it's probably more elegant and complex than any of the three Octomos. Um, and what a quarter of the price. So, yeah. Uh, organic. How is the organic fairing? My nose is soft. They get a little bit of Flintstone vitamins now on the nose. Whoa, still boozy and prickly on the palate. Mm. It's chalky and like slaty. It's like, you know, you made the comment about the Flintstone vitamins. It's like Bam Bam's been smashing, smashing a uh, slate rock or something. And it's, you know, there's dust in the air. It's very, very chalky, very mineral. Um, but yeah, it is sharp. Marty or Harmony, any comments on those two going back and revisiting them? I was just saying, I didn't drink the other ones. <laughs> I started with the Port Charlotte and just did the Octomores. And I'm wondering if I would have the same opinions of the whiskeys had I tried them all. Um, oh. That said, now that I've had that 12.3 last, I understand why people say it's the most complex. I would say it's the most classic. Um, it's not horrible. That's what we call damn it with faint praise from you. Yeah. Mm. I think I think the classic laddie is showing very nicely, although it's you know the heat is still roasting my tongue a bit from the octomores, but uh, the classic is still showing very well and the organic nice, but I I don't think it stands up to you know the 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 fruit the notes that are all coming through on the the classic. I think the classic is. Oh, doing it easy. Yeah, and I've I've just jumped ahead to the nine point one, and uh, as much as I like it, and I like it, I'm struggling with it being eight times the whiskey of the classic, and it's not. And to be honest, that whininess is now grown on the back end, and the finish to me falls apart entirely. I don't like finish on that at all. Mm. Five point one crazy. Eight. Nailed it. That was the best of the bunch. Which one? 5.1. You're right. It's the best of them. Mm -hmm. PAC, the Pac-Man edition. How's that showing? Nose is holding up right in my wheelhouse. I, I like, I think the, the, the poor Charlotte's decent but I'm getting this metallic note in it that I'm not loving. So that's fair. The, um, the palette's still good to me. Nose is still good. Palette's maybe just a little bit gun shy, but I like that style. I love it. I buy that. Mm -hmm. I just see Roy's um, there too tonight. Roy's with Paul. What's up? I love seeing all these familiar faces. Yeah, Paul and Roy, the dangerous duo. Um, Harmony and Marty, either of you guys have comments on the Black Art or the Port Charlotte? Um, I'm not huge. I'm not hugely impressed with the, the Black Art. I expected more for that price, but the, the uh, Port Charlotte, I'm liking. I think it's, it's pretty nice. Uh, just sort of, you know, more fondly recognized rec Recollect the old, like the PC5, PC6 type series. Mm -hmm. so those are really yeah. loved. This, yeah, those were this good. Like pretty, the... 
Um, I, I chugged my on. Port Charlotte, so <laughs> I really like it. it, and I I always uh, enjoy Port Charlotte. But mm-hmm. this uh, this particular one, yeah, I agree, was better than the PC. Um, it was really it was really lovely. I I really enjoyed it. That was my my first drink of the night, and and definitely needed before the Octomores. But I haven't tried the the Black Arts yet. Because of the cat, right? You needed the because drink. of the cat, of the yeah. Cat. Yeah. Okay. Just just clearing that up for everybody. I mean, I, yeah, I was sorry, think everyone. I was understanding it. I apologize um, for the cat's behavior this evening. <laughs> no, no, it's it's been entertaining for the rest of us. And and I mean, if only we could like if our imaginations could project an image on the screen of what we imagined was happening. Um, I bet what's happening is better than you could imagine. I'm not even joking. This cat is like a monster. (laughs) Don't give him any catnip then. Um, Can you take pictures with it? No, it doesn't stay still long enough. I gave him catnip before I left. So you don't have to do You could take pictures with your phone. Or she could turn her camera around and live stream the cat and not herself. But presuming she, the front camera's working? Yeah, maybe. And if not, if she could just take some stills that look like the cat's attacking her or something and post that as her like face profile pic or something, that would do uh, whiskey. We're here, we're here for the whiskey, folks. Um, <laughs> make it, make it look as though the cat is larger than it is. No, okay, it's, so it's we'll find an event. We'll call it Charlie's Whiskey Tasting, and it will be us drinking whiskey, but not talking about whiskey. And we'll just watch and videotape my cat, who ripped a hole in the bottom of my couch this evening and is now in my sofa, if you care to know. <laughs> so I'm dealing with that. Anybody want to attend a cat's and whiskey tasting? Harmony or a cat, cat funeral, cat? maybe? A I cat love that funeral he's in the could sofa. be happening. I love that he's in the sofa. That is such a great descriptor. Um, <laughs> Just quickly referencing Artem's question, Octomores have the uh, .x naming system due to different cast types, but does anyone know why the Black Arts do? So Artem to that, it's really just, there's been Black Art 1.1, 2.1, all the way to 9.1. They've not been annual releases, like they they seem to be released every other year, every year and a half, roughly. Um, but uh, yeah, that's just why they numbered them. There won't be 9.2s or 9.3s. I think too, Andrew, because they keep the recipe secret, it's always been Jim's mishmash of whatever, right? That was way, way it started with his little Heidi Klum story and everything he had with it. Um, they always had a blank check to do whatever they wanted. So if they gave you any more information as to what they were doing for cast type or style, mm-hmm. it's giving away the secrets of the black art. So I don't know why they put the point ones on there. They didn't really need to. It would have just um, been one through nine. Yeah, it could have just been a series number. Octomore, they always meant to, somebody asked the question earlier, the point ones are their standard release. The point twos are typically wine cask and almost always duty free. Every now and then we're lucky enough to land one. The point threes are Isla Barley and they tend to be the ones that are a bit more coveted, often with a slightly higher price. And the point fours are virgin oak now. And of course, they, if they come up with another concept, they can add on the point fives, point six, point sevens. But their the whole idea was this is a new identity for, for Gladi, the Octomore being its own line. Now, how do we have flexibility within that line? How can we subcategorize, basically? So that's what mm-hmm. they did there. Black Art did all of too. Okay, cool. Uh, there was a question in the chat about like the pattern of the distillation standards at Octomore. Is, are there standards or is each, each expression just an experiment? No, is there some are... rationale? Kurt, I, I don't know if you want to answer, but uh, I mean, if you're talking about the classic Brooklady versus Port Charlotte versus Lock and Doll versus Octomore, ver- and then, you know, they, they also had the X4 for a while. Sorry, I mean um, for o- Octomore. So well, no, but I mean, each of those will have a distillation style that they try to keep true to. Um, okay, so... So, Each Octomore, even though different finishes, their their distillation style is the same for all Octomores. It's the yeah. slow process. I think the so. only thing that differs is the, the peating level. And part of that is like when you start getting to that 80 to 220 or 240, it's very inconsistent. Like it's hard to get consistency 
So the only variable other than the cast that's going to change is the, the phenolic level. I think that's a good point when you do a tasting with a lot of big peated whiskeys like this to help people understand that a, a distillery's PPM level that stays consistent, we talk about Ardbeg at 55 or Croig at 45 or whatever, they can't just say, or they can't just peat the barley to 45 parts per million. You can't target that. Basically, you just burn peat in a, chim in a kiln, the smoke goes up the chimney and permeates the kiln floor. You end up with whatever comes out in the smoking process. The way you manage that and keep it to a consistent level is by marrying an unpeated malt to it to give yourself a 45 parts per million kind of average. All, it's all touching each other. It's all rubbing together and stuff. Then you mill that and you get a flour and whatever else out of that. And then you make your, your product, your end product done. And that gives you a consistent PPM level. With Octomore, they don't care. They just say, give us a bunch of peated barley, peat the hell out of it for X amount of time or do whatever the hell you want. When it arrives, we'll distill it and that's what it is. So they don't aim for a number. That's why Octomore is all over the map. It's just, it becomes what it is, which is cool because nobody else does that. Well, I mean, I guess there are some that do and it's the, the distilleries that traditionally floor malt because, yeah. you know, I think that's the reason why you see such variability in, um, sorry, in, in Springbank. Um, but then even I think the same could be said for Highland Park, Lafroig and Beaumore. You can see varying levels of peat and there's other things that play into it too. But a big part of that is that the floor maltings are notoriously inconsistent because you're, you're depending on climate conditions, weather, humidity, factors you just can't control for. So whereas if you're malting in a commercial malting plant, you can, to a certain degree, control for those, knowing what your humidity is, how much peat you're burning or smoking. You're not really burning it, you're smoking. Um, all those things you can control for on very precise levels. But, and I, and I don't know, I know, I think you feel the same way, Kurt. Like, I think that's what I love about the distilleries like Springbank where they, they peat their barley and it's like by time. Yeah. But like the, the climate's not always the same. So if you're only, if your logic is it's got to be 16 hours of peat for Springbank and 48 for, for long row, you're going to have some huge swings in variability. I, I've never understood this with whiskey drinkers where we get so um, tied to a brand or an expression it becomes to the detriment of all others. Uh, we've all got our favorite fallback movies. We might watch a handful of times or even a bunch of times, but I don't want to watch the same movie every night. I want to watch different movies. Why get married to the same whiskey and drink that same whiskey all the time? A distillery like Springbank, as Andrew was saying, is always going to vary. It's always going to be exciting. There's always going to be differences. Mm -hmm. Just like we're with what we're doing with our casting types here and everything. Life is short, man. Try it. Let it evolve. Let it be different. It's fun. Mm. Um, Ryan had a good question here. And actually, while I'm answering this, I'm going to fire the chat up. And I know we didn't go back and circle back on the Octomores, but I think we spent enough time on them. So I'm going to fire that poll up now. If you're sharing a feed, you you have to share a vote. That's just how it goes. But you do get two votes. You get a vote for first and second favorite. Um, Ryan was asking, where does the milling happen not at the distillery, I assume. And actually, Ryan, it does happen at the distillery. Uh, the vast, vast majority of distilleries in Scotland uh, receive their barley by truck. It's put into silos, and then it's milled to fill the mash tun um, as they're producing. Um, some distilleries hold their barley longer than others. It all comes down to production. But generally speaking, the milling happens at the distillery. Um, yeah, so that's what happens. And, you know, the crazy thing is the, the mills, um, the old historic mill companies like Porteous and what's the other one, Kurt? That Bobby. Bobby Mill. You know, they all went out of business because they made too good a product. I mean, all the distilleries tell you the same story, but really that milling stage is actually quite important because not only are you trying to get the rate, right ratio of, you know, um, essentially flour, husk, and uh, grist, but you're also trying to create enough grist that it's going to be a filter, or enough husk that it's going to be a filter for everything else so that it drains properly. Um, so good question. I'm not sure where the Spaceballs reference came in here, but I'm sure I'm missing something. It's, 
this is the best tasting ever. Like we have, <laughs> we have gone into some of the most amazing side conversations and tangents. Well done guys. I love it. But speaking want- of which, yeah. do you know where the Spaceballs came- comment came from? No, Kurt, Kurt, was talk- Kurt was talking about not wanting to watch the same movie every night. And they're just saying, you know, could watch Spaceballs every night. <laughs> Fair. I just wanted to offer a comment on, I think it was, was it Ryan at looking for a special occasion to open the 7.4? And I'd have to say that Virgin Oak edition was probably the only Octomore I really disliked. Oh. It just didn't hang together at all for me with the Virgin Oak. Mm. Fighting words. It's a huge <laughs> whiskey, that one. Huge. Yeah. And then what, where did the Diablo come in? There was that one that was in the red. Do you remember the one in the red, the red tube? uh the red tube was orpheus orpheus that's what it was mm, yeah the that matrix the, edition that was the 2.2 and holy crap what i wouldn't do to get my hands on more about um, i that do was have bordeaux thought, cask right it was which sir i think it was bordeaux cask i don't think it was bordeaux but it was a wine cask as was the <laughs> 4.2 the comus uh both of them were incredible um i thought which, comus yeah. was so turned I think Comus was so turned. I think you're dead on accurate, but I don't think that the um, Orpheus was Bordeaux. I could be wrong. So, but... so Jeff and or someone else, if you want to fact check that while we're chatting, right. chatting that would be great. Um, yeah. Okay. The poll, let's check in on the poll. Chateau Petrus, which is Bordeaux. So Andrew for the win on that. Bordeaux cask. Petrus is the most famous of the Bordeaux houses. So and you know. Kurt's wine ignorance shoots him in the foot and Andrew wins. Tur- turns out like turns out my brain is still okay. It's not good, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, all right. How are we doing on the poll? I think we're gonna call it because it's been up now for almost four minutes. 35 of 38 eligible voters have responded. And uh, what are the winners? Um, this might come as a bit of a surprise. But the Port Charlotte has taken top place in the first round of voting. That really surprises me. I love that. My favorite style from Brook Lowdy. I thought that was a brilliant expression and probably the most balanced of the whole night. That, mm-hmm. that is cool. And it won second favorite. That is crazy. Cool. Well, look at that. That's an interesting result. And That's awesome. I suppose one plus of that is it's half the price of the cheapest Octomore. So have at her, I guess. And I, I, I'm pretty sure there's actually quite a bit of it around still. Like they, they've been asking us if we want more. Um, well, I want to go around the horn quickly because we don't get a vote. And I mean, we've all been talking about what we like and what we don't like. But uh, starting with Marty, what was your number one favorite tonight? Uh, I'd say the, the Port Charlotte. Oh, man of the I'd, people. Then I'd go for the classic. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, think Harmony? I think classic showed really well. Uh, the classic has always been a favorite. I always have a bottle and it is the only scotch that I know I've repurchased like more than six or seven times. Like it, it I've never, I haven't rebought any whiskey the way I've bought the laddie. Um, and then I like the Octomore uh, 1.2. Oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> twelve point two. Um, I liked it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Kurt, Andrew, how about you? Uh, this is going to blow people's minds, including my own. But my favorite tonight was the Laddie Classic. That's um, amazing. I I can't believe how much I like that, and I think it's because I'm I've been all about spirit driven whiskeys now for about four or five years. And most of those are like 25 to 40 years of age. And this is probably seven to eight years of age. And it, it's blowing my mind how much I like it. So um, yeah, the Laddie Classic is my favorite. And actually the of the Octomores, the 12-2, the Sauterne. I don't, I don't know why, but that's my favorite from, that's my second favorite tonight. So I would not have picked those as my two favorites going into tonight's tasting. I was expecting Blackheart. And probably the 12.1. So that's the kind of result that makes whiskey exciting though. It kind of knocks you back a bit and go, okay, there's there's more out there. Let's keep this game going, right? Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. 
All right, Kurt. Yeah, man. Um, the Port Charlotte. Charlotte. I, mean, I love the Port Charlotte. Um, and then the the cleanest was the Octomore 12.1. It was great. But again, just if you're pouring me another drink, I want another one of the 12.3. So I'm going to go with the Port Charlotte and the 12.3. Having said that, if I had to pick one whiskey that it was just, this is all you can have, it would just be the classic Latin. It's just so cool. It's, it hits my palate in the right ways. Great young whiskey. Mm -hmm. Whoa, is this? I'm just looking at some of the comments. There's been some great comments tonight too, and probably not because everything we're tasting is above 46 and most of them above 50, but uh, yeah. Can we encourage that more? Answer. Actually, um, I know yeah. we can't get to all the comments. We try to interject them and we try to, you know, I think Andrew's really good at it too, jumping back to grab some of the ones that kind of scroll past us too when we can. Um, mm. But even if the interaction is in the comments, it makes it so much more like we're actually having a dialogue when we're in the room together. So please keep the comments coming. It's a lot more fun. Yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> been there's been some good ones in there, so they're quite enjoyable. Um, I, I uh, before we start winding this down, um, for those of you who live in Calgary, um, if you want to come see us in person on Saturday, we think that'll be possible. So please do if you feel like it um yeah there's uh what else we got going we're going to dump some new tastings on the website next week there'll probably be a newsletter out um so lots to look forward to we have a cool new 30th anniversary cast that most of you probably were not expecting but you're all really gonna love um we've got an we've got a cognac cast from chateau montifo it's our first bona fide 30th anniversary cast and the reason i say that is um we have a compass box blend coming that is off the chains good that we're really excited about like our 25th anniversary bottling and that was in the works that was in the pipeline um but while we were working on that we committed to two uh great king street casks the artist blend and the glasgow blend and they bought they managed to slip in their 30th anniversary on there. Even though those, are, those aren't true 30th anniversary bottlings, but you know we appreciate the thought from them on that. The compass box is coming, but the very first one is a Chateau Montefaux 1992 cognac. Um, we had a 25th anniversary 1992 cognac from these guys years ago. This is a small cognac house. Their cognacs are excellent. Um, I, I think really appeal to people that are into whiskey, not just cognac. Um, but what's cool about it is it's $5 more than the, the one we did five years ago for our 25th anniversary. So in an age of intense whiskey inflation, liquor inflation, um, somehow it's only gone up a dollar a year over the last five years for a new cask. So that's really cool. We'll have that out information on that next week. We have a Tomatin cask coming soon. We have a 1992 Glen Farkless family cask that we bottled for our 30th anniversary that, I, and I know this is one where we're like, we just couldn't, and we're trying to do the math. We're like, oh no, but we can't turn this down. We'll never get this chance again. So, so much cool stuff to look forward to. More great tastings coming up. And Kurt, it look, looks like you're, you're, you have a thought, you have a, no, I'm, I'm agreeing with everything you're saying. That, that Glen Park yeah. is in particular. So exciting. Yeah, I can't wait for that to come. And the, the fifth, is it the fifth or the fourth? There's a, there's a Glen, there's also a Glen Farkless Ego Series bottling coming, which may be the last, it's the fourth actually. It's the, we're not sure if there'll be another one after this, but it's coming too. And that almost didn't happen because Glenn Farkless is running short on stocks and tried to say no, but the agent insisted that they bring it in. So there's cool stuff. Do you remember we've got a Glenn Alecky coming? We have another Ben Romick. So you see Andrew saw that there was a, an oasis ahead for Glenn Farkless for getting his face and name on bottles. So he jumped companies over to the Boutique Whiskey Company. <laughs> so expect to see more Ferguson bottlings through the Boutique Whiskey oh. Yeah, like what what other monuments can we urinate on? Is uh, I suppose the question to ask. Um, but anyway, the Ram. Like, holy shit! Absolutely, you see that comment? Oh yeah, no, that 
I think we maybe we have to go really young and feisty for that one. Something oh. with a lot of torque. So wow. <laughs> yeah. All, while we're on that train of thought, though, it, it it has probably a lot of you have thought about this, and um, trust me, it, it's come up in our our minds as well too. There will likely be both a truckload and a door crasher sale at some point in the near future because you know, we got to have some fun with this and exploit it a little bit. So, uh, <laughs> and cat sky wants to see a harmony in her cat series. I think that's perfect for boutique. I think they can draw something up for that. So <laughs> as long as I but can anyway. pick the barrel, I'm in. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see that we didn't get to pick the last one. It was kind of a yes or no, but you never know. It, it might happen. Um, well, listen, everybody, I think, uh, that's about a wrap. Um, some great questions tonight. A lot of great feedback. <laughs> Fart clap. Oh man, this could just keep going for a while. It could get dangerous. But uh, thank you very much for taking part in tonight's tasting. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to thank um, Kurt and Marty and Harmony for joining me uh, tonight to talk Brook Laddie. Um, the only thing that could have been better is if we had like, you know, one of the boys from Brook Laddie on tonight. And just imagine how awkward they would get with some of this trying to represent that corporate side of things. It would have been funny. We'll do that at some point in the future. Maybe when we got our, oh yeah, we have another Brook Laddie cast coming too. So there's that as well. Oh, oh my God, the comments today. Are these recorded and these things? <laughs> yes. Oh my they're... God. Oh, you the guys comments. Me laugh so hard. I think we can download it. Who just Glenn typed Fartless. Glenn Fartless? I missed whose name it was, but that I think that's one yeah. of the Andrews twins. So. Jesus. Oh my yeah. lord. Yeah, Sky. They, the the, the Aunt, Sky and Stefan have some good ones. They're they're sleepers. They're, they just kind of sit there like snipers. They come up with some great one-offs. So wow. like um, Charlie Sparts. Yeah. So <laughs> Lots to look forward to, and maybe we'll get uh, we'll get one of the boys from Brook Laddie to join us when our next cast comes up. But uh, until the next tasting, everyone, thanks very much for tuning in. I hope you had a good time. I hope you enjoyed the whiskeys. Um, and if you didn't learn anything, hopefully you were at least mildly entertained. Um, so until the next tasting, uh, have a great night. Good. Good night. Good night. <laughs>